All right, so the college savant is not with us today. This is the Bob Ryan podcast. We're not even going to mention he who shall not be named. <laughs> We're not going to mention his name. The other guy who's usually here. That's right. He's, he's a, who's he's in a, Texas, wherever the hell he is. Busy man. Bus yes, Jeff Goodman is a busy man. Bob Ryan, I love the Phoenix Suns. I love the Phoenix Suns. And my question for you to kick things off is, while they were in the finals, are they considered a true contender when they play in the West with Golden State? Positively. You can't, they've had, as we speak, they're on a 12-game winning streak. They've already had an 18-game winning streak. I don't know how much more people need to see. You realize that in the year 2022, they're a legitimate contender, one of the two top contenders uh, to win the championship in the West. And that presupposes that everybody's healthy, but it presupposes that 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 um, the things that Golden State's counting on, such as Clay Thompson rounding back to about fully to about eighty percent of his old self, uh, and and they have Draymond Green, who was extremely important, uh, is is there. By the way, I got to throw. I know you thought. All right, we'll get to this. We'll get to the Warriors. I love the Suns with you, as as you do. Um, you know, a Aiton won me over last year. I wasn't ready to like him as much as as I as I do. A uh, Booker is just a, a stud. He's completely. You know, when every time, anytime he gets 35, you're not surprised. Um, they still got Chris Paul. They still got something left in the tank. Uh, uh, Bridges, of course. Uh, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot to like about that team. You know, while the Suns, you know, are flourishing, then you look at the Nets. And, you know, in the past, we thought with the Nets, okay, they get healthy for the playoffs, they can make a run. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just beginning to wonder if it's going to work out. They've dropped the two in a row at the time of this tape, and they lost to the Kings. And... Harden is a shell of himself. Durant is still not playing. And Kyrie, I mean, if you're on the road, he can play. He puts up numbers. He's he's walked right back in playing as if nothing ever happened in terms of his actual play, it seems to me. Uh, but it's the most bizarre circumstance, I think, in any major yeah. American sport we've ever known. The, the, a serious question has been posed. and it, it can't be answered, but it's been posed. Would they prefer to have a seventh game on the road? And the answer is, you know, in, in any series. I mean, and the answer has to be yes. Yes. <laughs> because that's the only time he plays, unless something changes between now and then. It's it's just, I can't deal with it. I mean, I just can't wrap my head around the idea that what's going on, the way he's is adapt, you know, uh, uh, playing this season or not playing. That's I just look at that team and I just think they're cursed. You know, we thought it was going to be an automatic. It's going to be the Warriors or it's going to oh. be the Lakers and the Nets for the next five years. And man, they are just cursed. Well, you know, they came so close last year. If, and all kidding aside, this is not a joke. This is, I mean, you, people make jokes. I mean, we say it because it's true. If Kevin Durant's foot was one inch shorter, uh, they win last year. Yeah. With that foot on the line. And, uh, you know, they probably would have won. And, and yeah, I feel bad about Durant because I thought last year, in you know, a losing effort was one of the most singular. Uh, prolific is probably an over, but I, I, you know, I thought it was fantastic. I thought his effort in a losing cause was just, I'm like, look, Duran, you're grouchy, but God, can that kid he's good. Oh, he's good. I mean, he's a top 10 all time player now, Duran. And no uh, question. No, yeah. he's, he's, he's a, just a scary talent. And at the peak of his game at 33 still, but uh, he's got to be out there, you know, but that's always the case in sports, you know, to get, Get, a, get people have to be out there. We knew from the start of the season with the Lakers that that uh, with all those old guys, somebody's going to get hurt. A lot of right, them. Are, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. the six the Sixers won the other night without Joel and B. Doc seems to have turned yeah. things around. So, are they legit now? Are they a threat? I, I think they're they've stepped up. Uh, you know, we, we've gone through a Chicago phase we've, uh, in terms of who who's a contender. Uh, and and when they're fully healthy, they're not healthy now. They don't have Lonzo. Haven't had him. Uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, oh, I, I, I like the Sixers. I, by the way, I was a, a charter member of the Max, Tyrese Maxey fan club at Kentucky. I liked them, saw them and liked them. Um, and, and I'm uh, I'm so glad that they're doing what they're doing without you know who. I won't mention the man, a name whose name I will not mention, but he's six feet nine. And Here we go. And he's percent yeah. free throw line last year. And you have to take him out of playoff games in the end because because he doesn't want to get fouled. And he wouldn't shoot the ball. Uh, you know, that guy, there's a guy like that. And he's not playing because he's not happy with play, with the circumstance in Philadelphia. So I'm so happy that they're doing what they're doing without him. Now, question, it's been, and I'll jump, uh, I'll, I'll sign on to this course. Okay, Daryl Morey, get something. Right, right. Get something to help your team. 
I mean, you, you have a shot here. You can improve your team. Uh, 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 you know, do, use, don't, don't be greedy. Get something. I don't care. If it's well, the East is wide open. It's wide open now. I look at Milwaukee and I think, okay, you've got the freak, so he's the consistent element. But it's wide open because you don't know what's going to happen with Brooklyn. No, Chicago, it, you just may raise the issues. The, the thing is flipping wide open. And by the way, if Miami gets healthy at, at yeah. the right time, they, they're in that discussion. So right. they, you know, because there was a, not the Miami team that, you know, that, they, that they shouldn't have. No, but Philly is in this discussion now, I think. And Bede. Oh my God, the number he's having, you know, everybody said MVP, he's having a phenomenal year. And uh, uh, I'm very nice that they could win a game without him. But, but um, he, he's a, you know, I know one team that can't handle him. He plays in Boston in TD Garden. Yeah. You know, he, he kills them. They can't, they can't deal with him uh, right now. Once upon a time, they thought Warford is there, but no, they, they can't deal with him. Well, what frustrates me is when people say there aren't, any, you know, the league isn't about the big man anymore. I go, well, no, when you get a good big man, there is. See, I've been saying that if the guy's right guy shows up, you know, it's not about the big, the conventional big man, except that, except when it is. <laughs> and, and uh, right. you know, really, yeah, it's, it's true. Um, so, and he's, he, he can play the, the old fashioned power post game and he can, and he can step out and he's a modern, very much a modern guy, you know, uh, as, as, as of course is Jokic and, and, and a few others of those European big men, but, but uh, Embiid, uh, uh, he's, he's, he's a scary dude, that guy. Bob, are you ready for the Ryan five? Sure. Well, kind of, maybe four out of five, but I think. Okay. Uh, no, the first one is best quote. And what I mean by that is not the actual quote, but the player, when you would go into a locker room, you would go, that's my guy. There's one guy that uh, in my time, uh, you know, from 69 until retirement, 2012, official retirement, that was I call that there's only one guy I, I labeled as the conscience of the team at the particular point in time with when he played for that team, and that was Paul Silas. He he was a, a, a candor, uh, uh, just insight, uh, fearlessness. Uh, you know, um, Paul Silas would be. Now there were other fun. Kevin McHale was relentlessly quotable. And, and the thing I always thought was fun for us as writers about Mikhail is that he'd come up with these analogies and metaphors and they always were right. They weren't stupid. Other people try and they failed. He didn't fail. He got it right. He got the metaphor right. He got the simile right. You know, it was, uh, he was amazing. Uh, he was, he was fun. Um, but Paul Silas would be my guy as, uh, as the, uh, the, the, the unfailing. Now, as John Havlicek, it's funny because as, as, as time went on, he got, he got more and more, I don't know how to call it, mirthful. Uh, he loosened up more and more. There, he was a, a, a much more a sort of uninhibited, fun-loving guy by the time he retired than he was when I first encountered him in 1969. But, but Silas was unquestionably the, the most uh, forthright person that I dealt with. Well, you know, 17 is my favorite number for a reason. I mean, John Havlicek always, it was the greatest thrill of my life. And after, after being in sports for a long time, you know, meeting athletes, that never is a big deal. I mean, I, I, I just like you meet guys and you're like, oh, you know, whatever. But Havlicek was always special to me. And the one thing, I, Tommy always told the story about how John was rolling so tight. He had to have like wooden hangers or something in his locker. And they had to be just, just so. Well, my favorite, my recollection is not the hanger, not the, the hangers so much. Of, but I, uh, in general terms, I wrote and said, um, that his locker looked like the general was coming to, for inspection. Right. <laughs> and he arranged his cologne bottles and stuff in ascending height left to right. Yeah. But the coup, he, when he would wear a, a executive socks, you know, knee length socks, yeah. he would take them off and hang them over, hang them up. That's him. And, and, and drape them over the bar. So, uh, yeah, he was very meticulous. Uh, and, 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 and Silas, I love the Silas point um, because I just remember him at 6'5", and the guy, I think he led the league in offensive rebounding one year at 6'5". Well, he's 6'7". Oh, he's was six, he? Oh, 6'7". Yeah. Yeah, okay. no, offensive rebound was a, a particular forte of his. He, he, he had a science about it. Uh, there's no question. Uh, he, was the, he was the reigning offensive rebounder in the league uh, uh, in, his, in, in, the, in the late 60s, early right. 60s. Which, yeah. made, by the way, just with um, just a little extension here, uh, 
the first, I, I did a detour on a Celtic trip back in 1975 and, and went to a couple of ABA games out West when I had nights off. And, and um, one of them uh, was in Denver and I walk in and I, I think maybe in Utah, it doesn't matter. They were playing Denver and I knew Larry Brown and I'm talking to Larry and, and he's telling me that Moses Malone, this is the rookie, uh, right directly out of Petersburg, Virginia. Then Moses Malone, he says the best offensive rebound I've ever seen in my life. And I said, uh, Larry, better than Paul Silas. And he said, yes. And, you know, and of course, offensive rebounding was forever a, a forte of his. But anyway, yeah. Silas was an offensive rebound. He once showed me something. He had a little technique uh, where he said you, he would run out of, let's say he's a picture the basket. He's on the left side. Okay. And he would run out of bounds and out of bounds and then come in and, and, and nudge out right. position on the other side to, to act, act, block out a guy. And, you know, how cool is that? It's smart. Yeah, you got Tell it. me one other thing, too. Uh, uh, when teams, remember a thing that, I mean, this is really dating us, Gary. Remember a thing called the fast break? <laughs> you remember that yes. was organized and had an outlet pass and had a, a yeah. wing man and had wingmen and a trailer, you know. He he showed me that he, he not every basket, I mean, every shot, naturally, but he could angle himself so he would get the re offensive rebound and immediately propel himself with two fast dribbles to the free throw line and then pass the ball off to, right. to you know, well, it, it, I, you know, the, the guy, the guy was a thinker. Yeah. And that's why he was like one of how many of Red's players that became coaches, you know, they all became coaches. Oh God. So um, many. Uh, best dressed. You know, the chief was good. Robert, Robert was impeccably dressed. What about, what about Clyde Frazier, man? Oh, you mean I'm talking about Celtics? Oh, oh no, anybody, oh, anybody? Oh my God! Oh, oh no! Oh yeah! Well, of course he, 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 he was in his time. Uh, the man, uh, Mike, Michael, always dressed very impeccably. Uh, Jordan, uh, this, uh, yeah, that's a very good one. But yeah, no, Fred Fraser was the fashion maven of of, of all. Now oh, a lot God. of guys have, have modern guys dress dress them very creatively, wow. but but uh, uh, Fraser was. Probably the, the gold gold star winner. Well, I just remember Antoine Walker had a new suit for every game. Oh, that's a lot. That's a yeah. That's him. and 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 I think uh, Alan Iverson had a new what sweatshirt maybe for every game or something. Yeah, like and that. that's and and I think that's why poor Antoine went broke. Okay, yeah, these are for anybody, Bob, in your career. Okay, um, most you know when I say most underrated, most unappreciated, most underrated player. Well, I think in as history it goes on now. Uh, I, I I'll put it this way: the most forgotten great player is was Andrew Tony, and his, it, it, it was a comet that flashed across the sky, and his career ended premature, prematurely due to not one but two bad feet, two 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 irresolvable issues with his with his feet. Uh, I mean, he, he was probably only about twenty six or so. I'm guessing, but um, at his peak, he was frightening. If, if you, there, there was nothing he could he he. he was the most I call him the most contemptuous guard I ever I saw. I mean, he laughed at double teams, you know, and, and they were they were like a joke to him. And, but he he could uh, uh, he he is now been forgotten. I'm trying to think though in this time, uh, uh, I'd have to dwell on that a little bit. That uh, uh, that who during the time was 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 uh, underrated. But as time has gone on, he's the most forgotten great player in NBA history. I always thought Connie Hawkins didn't get his due. Did you like the hawk? The hawk. Hawk was, you know, his first year in the league, he was all league, first team. And, uh, but uh, Hawk gave it to you when he wanted to give it to you. Oh, okay. And Joe Gilmartin, the great writer in Phoenix, uh, used to talk about Hawk as a portrait in still life at times, I think, you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, obviously he was a very gifted guy and a, and a very intriguing guy and, and, and is a, you know, he has a place in history naturally due to what, what happened to him and, and, you know, why he was not in the NBA for all those years. Now, this is my favorite question. The next two of my favorite questions. Best assisted coach. Oh, that's ever. easy. Yeah. Uh, they, they, uh, they each were, had, well, and it's Johnny Bach with the Bulls. The Bulls. Was, was the, the uh, for sure. We had the other guy, and, and he was the living proof uh, of, of one of my favorite sports axioms is that not every lieutenant is cut out to be a general. Jimmy Rogers. Yeah. Jimmy Rogers was a great assistant coach. And, and you know, he, he got handed to Celtics because he got a raw deal. 
he gets the Celtics and Larry goes out for the year. <laughs> right. That isn't good. And then the next year, um, you know, Larry wasn't happy the way he was being used, I guess, the second time. Yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, Jimmy Rogers is an easy, easy call there. I'll tell you who my favorite was to talk to. You know, I, I, he was my go to guy on that particular team, getting insight and getting quips. And that was Dave Wool when he was with the Lakers. Cyber uh, guy. Used to see, I, I used to see him at the market. Penn guy, you know, but uh, I'll never forget, I had my, my then maybe, let's see, this would be my, my it was probably an enemy his teenage years. My son at the time with me one night, and we we're before the game, and we we're talking to Dave Wool, and he's talking about synapses. And, Michael Jordan had faster synapses than, than, than uh, anybody else he had seen, you know. And, and you know, my son was, like, very impressed. <laughs> this, you know, this coach was using the word synapse, you know. <laughs> but just, he, was, he was fun. He never he never got a head coaching job, did he? It guess. was strange. You know, it's interesting. I don't want to speak for him. I don't know. I, I used to see him literally at the market. And we would – and if I saw him, it was 30 minutes in the bread aisle because he had watched every game the night before. <laughs> and he – you know, the thing that's real, like, it's great talking to you, Bob. I mean, I could listen to you talk all day long. We know that. But when you talk to a guy like, like Wool or even John Carroll, for that matter, these guys, and you sit there and, like, you listen to them break down the game, and you're just, like, you're mesmerized. Yeah, you're just, like, you're just mesmerized. I mean, they break down every play the way no, a golfer breaks but, down. you know, when, when I did my book, 48 Minutes, with Terry Pluto, which was a, a – about one game in the NBA, January 16th, 1987, the Cavaliers at the Celtics, every minute detail of the game and, and portraits of the players. And, and, and um, I did, I sat and watched the game on, on tape with Jimmy Rogers and broke, and he broke it down for me. And uh, it, it was phenomenal. It was it's amazing. amazing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's there. It's at another level. Best. I think I know the answer to this. And I'm going to, you can give a Boston one, but then you have to give one on the road. But I think right. I know the answer. Best game day bar. Uh, Major Goolsby's in Milwaukee. Johnson. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Major Goolsby's in Milwaukee. Uh, uh, what I loved was in Denver called Duffy's. And uh, that was downtown. I like that. I'm trying to think now. Let me think. Uh, uh, now in New York, it. it you know, there were Runyons in New York, of course, at the, in its highlight, uh, in its heyday, of, which was lasted for about 20 years, uh, originally on 50, uh, 50th Street and, and then later on 2nd Avenue around the corner, um, for sure. Um, but uh, that, that Denver one was underrated, uh, Duffy's, but, uh, but Major Goolsby's was, you know, that fondness. Uh, so many of us have a fondness. The 1974 finals uh, where, where that was the social center of the, of the whole finals. It was great. In fact, we got to the point where... Uh, and the off-day press conferences, they figured everybody was hanging out at the, at, at Goolsby, so they had it there at, at, at a conference room. Yeah, you know, at, God love Goolsby's. Good good cheeseburger, too. But that, that would be my all-time favorite NBA bar. The fact that they had a press conference at a bar is just... That was the NBA of, you know, of accessibility, and, and we're all in this together. It was a giant fraternity. I'll tell you my favorite anecdote of the time. Uh, we, this is when we were no charters. It was, everybody was flying commercial. And the Celtics were flying uh, east to west. And we got to Chicago. We had to change planes. We didn't even have a direct flight. And, we're, and uh, we had time to kill. And we're walking down to the bar. I mean, we, everybody. And, and we saw these very large people coming up against us uh, the other way. And it was the Phoenix Suns. They were going west to east. And everybody got together in the bar, both teams, coaches, broadcasters, you know, writers. Uh, it was a little fraternity meeting at the NBA. You know, it, 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 that was it. That spoke to the times. Yeah, that's great. Well, Bob, um, I, could, I could listen to Bob Ryan's stories all day. Uh, also, pick up Scribe if you guys have and if you guys are new to the podcast. Bob, thank you, my friend. We'll see if uh, Mr. Goodman has time for us next week. A busy fellow, but uh, he'll, he'll, he'll do his best. He'll do his best. <laughs>